We are thankful for your presence this morning. We have some of our regulars out sick and traveling, but we have visitors with us. And for that, we are very grateful. It is our determination as the spring congregation of God's people to do all things according to the authority of Jesus Christ as set out in the New Testament of Christ. We want all here to know that we want to do our best to always examine ourselves honestly in the light of the right and divided Bible that we can be sure that we are pleasing to God in doing those things that he's taught us to do. I would like this morning to study with you for a little while concerning the love of God as seen in the life of faithful Abraham. When you look into your Bible, it doesn't take very long if you are a student of it, as the word student means, to find that uh, Abraham is selected in various books to show forth dedication and faithfulness to God and his love of God. He is pictured as the father of the faithful. And thus, in that, he shows us how to approach God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the last will and testament of his son. We all recognize, if we accept the Bible as the inerrant, the all-sufficient, final and complete revelation of God, that Jesus said in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And thus we certainly are caused to reinforce our own lives to be sure that we're serving our master. For he is an absolute monarch, king over his kingdom, which is the church. And thus his word is the light that we follow that leads from earth to heaven. If you look into Abraham's life, you will see that was his disposition toward God and whatever it was that God demanded of him. He so took God at his word, understood that God said what he meant, and meant what he said, and then he sought to comply with everything God wanted him to do, thus manifesting his trust, his faith, his confidence, his belief in God, and the things that are of God. Now, the particular point I want to make this morning is uh, that which has to do with the great love of God that was in Abraham that will help us today in developing our love of God and his Christ and all things that pertain thereto. Now, you know, at least most of you do, that when we manifest our desires in the sense of, or our thoughts about someone or something in the sense of loving it, and that we only have one word that we can use in the English language, L-O-V-E. So I can say I love my wife, I love my children, I love my dog, I love to hunt, I love sports, I love God, I love a good book. And how do we know what we're talking about when we use that word love? Well, it's the subject in the sentence and the context in which it's found to know just exactly in the English language what we mean by love when we say I love my dog and it also say I love my wife and then I love my God. But now you know as well as I do that in the Greek language, the Koine, common Greek of the first century in which the New Testament was written by inspired writers, that there were four words. And those words help us to understand the different flavors or shades or kinds of love that exist among all men at all times. The first and highest love is agape. A lot of people say a lot about that over the years, but they don't really know what it really is. I say it's the highest form of love because it always seeks one's highest good. No matter the sacrifice, no matter the pain and anguish that one must go through, it nevertheless seeks the other's highest good. The, of course, sum and substance and epitome of that love is in Jesus Christ. In all that he did from leaving heaven to become a man and as a man to be tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, and to go through the agonies of Gethsemane, but keep his life in subjection to the Father's will, which was that he would die that terrible death on the cross. In so doing, offer his body a sacrifice for our sins and shed blood from that body for the remission of our sins. Greater love, he said, hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for 
his friends. Well, Jesus not only laid down his life for his friends, but he laid down his life for his enemies, even those that nailed him to the cross and those that cried out, crucify him, crucify him. It's an amazing thing. It's not a love that's connected with emotions. It's a love that can be commanded. I say that because there was nothing pleasant about the crucifixion of Christ, what he had to undergo, but he did it anyway. It is a love that says, if this is right, as God defines the right, I will do it. Yes, but look what it's going to cause you to have to suffer and sacrifice. Nevertheless, it's right. And when you read 1 Corinthians 13, one of the qualities or attributes of this agape love is that it always rejoices in the truth. It does not rejoice in iniquity. So it means that this love is in complete harmony with the truth of the living God, which truth is in the Word of God, which truth sets us free, and is the only thing that can set us free from sin, John 8, 31 and 32, and John 17, 17. That's why we're taught to rightly divide the Word of Truth as a proper way to study it. There's a right way and a wrong way, 2 Timothy 2, 15, and we must learn the right way. All of these comments are sermons or more than one sermon within themselves. And I call your attention once again to Abraham's faithful service to God and the proof of his love of God. And we're seeing then uh, that agape, highest form of love. Now, there are three other words. I'll mention eros in passing because as that word has to do with the erotic sexual love, it nowhere appears in the scriptures, but don't think the Bible doesn't discuss such. Those familiar with their Bible certainly knows what uh, the scriptures have to say about husband-wife relationships in that area, and thus the concept of the idea is discussed there, though the word itself is never there. But there are two other words that are in the scriptures that the Greeks had for love, one of them phileo, philia, which has to do with the brotherly love. The very close friendship, such as David and Saul's son Jonathan had with one another. We would say best buddies maybe today. Somebody very close to you. Now, the next one is the word stergo, which by itself nowhere appears in the scriptures, but combines with other words, and it has to do with the familial love, the love that we have within a family. This doesn't mean that there's not the phileo love there, too. Uh, they're, they're there. But now when you consider eros, phileo, <clears throat> and stergo, they involve affection. They involve feelings. They involve emotions. Now let me drive a peg right down there for a moment and point out the situation in our culture and society in most of the Western world today. Most people think of love only as some sort of emotional thing, some sort of affection, and they've even corrupted some sort of sick, sentimental emotionalism that's very subjective and surges and wanes according to the person and the situation and circumstances that person's in. That's because these are emotional loves. Agape is not that way. When God said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's the agape love. It meant this is what's necessary to do to save man. Nothing else can save him. It must be done. That's the disposition of Christ when he came in the flesh and when he lived on this earth. Remember, concerning his death, he would say to his disciples, to this end was I born. He knew when he came into the world how he would leave this world. And he willed himself. Nobody remember. He said, takes my life from me. I lay it down. So he willed himself to go to the cross. He willed himself to be nailed to that cross. He willed himself to stay there six hours when he never had to go anyway. And in the garden he said, if I don't want to go, I have all these legions of angels that will take care of the matter. But he wanted to go. He desired to go. He willed to go because of agape love. Had nothing to do with how he felt. For if he went by his feelings, when you read in the garden, he wouldn't have gone. And so this is the highest form of love. Now, it regulates the other three emotional, affectionate loves. And in the case of Eros, passionate love. It regulates it. When you have the agape love, Paul so marvelously in a splendid manner and detail explains and discusses 1 Corinthians 13, you always see it has a sacrificial disposition. 
It has the desire that says, no matter what, I'll serve thee. That's just the way it's going to be. I think of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they were commanded to fall down with everybody else in Babylon to worship that idol, and they said, we're not going to do it. It made Nebuchadnezzar so mad he could bite the nail in two. And uh, he tells them what's going to happen. And they very calmly, but very straightforward, frank and candid say, uh, we're not going to worship your idol. God has the power to deliver us, but whether he does or whether he does not, we will not worship your idol. Now, that's in the Bible to tell us plainly in those days when miracles were done that when he went ahead and cast them into the furnace, having made it hotter than ever, and even killed the men that threw them in, that when Nebuchadnezzar looked in that furnace, he said, Did we not cast three men into the fire? How is it that they're walking around down there and I see a fourth man in the fire whose likeness is as the Son of Man? Now, why is that in your Bible when you read it? What does it do for you today serving Christ under the teaching of the New Testament? Why, if it doesn't create courage in you and strength and give you greater determination out of the agape love to obey God, pray tell what's it designed to do if it doesn't tell us God cares for his children. And so we could go throughout the whole of the Bible along that line. But I want you to keep in mind then those loves. And again, I want to emphasize agape is the highest form of love because it can be commanded. It can be something that you can know you do it and it hurts to do it, but it's right to do it. It's God's will and you do it. So Jesus would say in Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. And those are the marching orders of the army of the Lord, the church, until the end of time. So uh, we understand that you have these other loves. They're there. They're good. They're wholesome. The Bible talks about them. Sometimes uh, they will even connect with the form of agape to show the affection that's there and the love of the brethren and so on. Nevertheless, without the agape form of love, the others, because they are emotional, will to lead you anywhere, no matter where, and will cause you to violate God's will. You need the governing power of agape love so that the others will be regulated and kept where they ought to be. In other words, I can love my wife and I ought to. I can love my children and I ought to. But those are the stergo and philea uh, types of affection and emotions. What's to keep me from loving them so much that I transgress God's law to have their love? Agape. For it always leads one to obey God's will no matter what. And it regulates those. Now, with that in mind, I want you to consider in the next few minutes what we have about Abraham. Introduced to us in the latter verses of chapter 11 of Genesis as Abram. And of course his wife, as we were first introduced to her, is Sedei. They would probably call Abram Abram. And uh, that is not the way we say it, because we speak English, so we say Abram. Nevertheless, when you come down to Shem's family record, his genealogy, in verse 10 it begins, after, of course, Noah, before that the flood, and all that's left is Shem, Ham and Japheth, and Noah, and their wives. We see then, now mark this as a right division of the Word of God. In that patriarchal age, the long, long ago, as God was in the origin of things, not only the creation of the world and all things of the universe, but the creation of man. And then we see the first sin. We get the first inkling of God extending mercy to man in Genesis 3.15. And that it would be through the seed of a woman that the serpent, who is the devil, would find a mortal wound inflicted upon him. Though the uh, serpent would inflict a wound up in the heel of the seed of woman. And then that begins to develop from a messianic promise. And now when you come down to this side of the flood, why do you have those genealogies of those three? Because out of those three sons of Noah, the whole world was populated. But why does he drop, drop Ham and Japheth and spend so much time on Shem? Well, from Shem came the Semites. And from the Semites came the Hebrews. And from the Hebrews came the Israelites. Thus, he's moving from the messianic promise as the unfolding of the scheme of redemption takes place to the messianic family. Actually, he will then move from there into the messianic nation. And that's where he's headed. Somebody said, 
talking about God when man sinned in Genesis, he headed for Pentecost. And there's full declaration of the gospel for the first time that men can be literally and actually justified in their sins and reconciled for Christ has paid it all. And the gospel, the power of God and the salvation, the gospel of Christ, is extended to man in the proclamation and defense of the same. But over here, we're able to see in this record of genealogy of Shem that we introduced to Abram toward the end of it. Let me very quickly notice that as you start in chapter 12, you'll have God's call to Abram. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from the kindred, from thy father's house, new land that I will show thee. Now listen, I will make, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And then we come over and see a trip that he makes down into Egypt. We then see uh, his separation from his nephew Lot. Both are exceedingly wealthy men of that time. So much so the land couldn't hold both flocks. And the herdmen from each one got into it one another. Great lessons in all of these, but that's not our point now. Remember, we're talking about the love of God in faithful Abraham. But you'll see him moving then to Hebron after... Uh, Lot chooses the well-watered plain of Jordan and pitches his tent toward Sodom. He then uh, rescues Lot because Lot was traked in the great battle. Have the marvelous story of Melchizedek that's referred to in the writer of Hebrews, who is from Salem, which would be Jerusalem, the peace of God in time to come. And he was a priest of God. Abraham paid tithes to him. And then in 15, chapter 15 of Genesis, once again, the Abrahamic covenant is mentioned. And as you come on through, you will see uh, Hagar and Ishmael and the discussion having to do with just how Abraham would have a son, and it would be a son not from a handmaid like Hagar, but from his own wife, Sarai. Then we come over and find, the, and this is a wonderful discussion, and here it ought to begin to understand something about a religion of faith and the circumcision to be a sign of the covenant that was given. You have the promise of a son, who we know now as Isaac. Then you have uh, the situation with God going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain, and God begs, uh, or rather Abraham begs God that there would be no destruction if you could find a certain amount of people starting with 50 and coming down to 10, which it could not be. Then you have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then you have also Abraham and Abimelech. That's another interesting study. But then in chapter 21, remember this is the development of the Messianic family. You have Isaac is born. But immediately, and this is where we will rest the rest of this sermon, the very next chapter is we have our Bibles divided into chapters and verses. We have God putting Abraham's faith to a test. And here is where we see a great study when it comes to the matter of Abraham. And you'll see it echoed in Hebrews 11. You'll see Stephen go back over as he presents the gospel to the Jews in Acts chapter 7. <coughs> you'll see that he's referred to in Galatians and in Romans. So many things about Abraham that's so important to us regarding his faith and love of God. If we, under Christ in the New Testament, as children of God, Christians, are to develop this kind of faith and this kind of love. And thus he's referred to in James chapter 2 is the example of how that faith with works is a saving faith. But that faith without works is a dead faith and will not save anybody. And the thing that we need to learn about love and faith is that whether you're under the patriarchal dispensation from Genesis 1-1 to the giving of the law of Moses to the Jews in Exodus 19 and 20, a period of 2,500 years, faith is always formed in a person by the reception of God's word, and the faith that saved was always the faith that obeyed. Then you come down to the days of the Jews and the law of Moses as they approach God through that economy, and guess what? Faith is still formed in men by the word of God. And it still saves them when it leads them to be obedient to God's will. 
You see in those two great times, a period of 1,500 years, both times covering all the way in Genesis 1-1, to put both dispensations together, down to the cross with the nailing of the law of Moses at the cross, actually the church starting in Acts chapter 2, and thus the full authority of Christ in the New Testament comes forth by the apostles preaching and Peter's sermon recorded in Acts 2. All that time preceding that, Faith was formed by the reception of the Word of God, whether they're under patriarchy or whether they're under the law of Moses. Faith saved them when they obeyed, and it never saved them just by mentally assenting to the fact that this is the Word of God. It had to be a living, active faith in that they took God at His Word and obeyed or put it into practice in their life. And that's when Abraham became a friend of God. That's when the Bible says he was called the friend of God, when he was tested, as we shall study in Genesis 22. In the offering of his son Isaac. There's where we see the love of God, the agape love of God take control. And the faith that saves, being the faith that obeys, shine forth as an example to every one of us. And causes us to examine ourselves as we look into the great will of Jesus Christ concerning how he saves us. Which dispensation, the Christian, Christian dispensation, has been going on now for nearly 2,000 years. It makes no difference, again, I say, about which dispensation and which law of God is governing what men. Faith is always formed by hearing and understanding the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And that faith always saves and only saves when it will lead one to comply with God's will. And thus, Hebrews 5, 8 and 9 says, he were, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Well, go back with me. So much has happened in that narration we gave you a while ago. So much has happened. And you see how he cannot understand as a very aged man and his wife very aged beyond normal biological bearing of children that they can have children but God said it and if you read through it in one place it pretty well says when he's wondering how that's going to happen he says I told you you'd do it and you did it so we could go into more on that but I said that's the way it's going to be and I mean it what God says he means and that's what we must understand so in chapter 22 and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt the King James Version says now I know other versions say test and that's right because tempt in the Elizabethan English meant to try somebody or to solicit somebody to sin. Well, may I tell you, as James declares, God never solicits anybody to violate his will. But he does put your faith, your belief, and your trust to the test. Do you have faith, confidence in him more than anything else? And thus that test must be one that says this is right for one reason only. God said so. There are a lot of things that are right that you can do for all sorts of reasons other than because God said so and you love him. But this one means that it's in your faith is tested that there's only one reason you would do this. Only one reason it's right. And no other reason because God said so. In fact, at other times it may be it's actually wrong to do. And how many times do you find in the patriarchal mosaical dispensations Warning to the people of God, do not do as these pagans do and offer up your children's sacrifices. But then notice, God puts Abraham to a test. And he says unto him, Abraham, he said, now listen to this attitude, here am I. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, if there had ever been a time somebody wanted to sleep late, this would have been it. But notice the next verse. Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went from the place of which God had told him. Faith leads you to obey God's will. Somebody says, I have great faith in God. Well, I don't do that. You don't have faith in God. Somebody says, oh, I love you with all that I am. Well, I'm not going to do that. You don't love God. Jesus said, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments. Now, you want to see that in Abraham? Why he selected inspiration as an example to every one of us in many places in the Bible? 
Takes up a lot of space telling about his life in the book of Genesis more than anybody else. But now notice it took a while to get there. Can you imagine what was going through his mind? Listen, verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here with the ass. And I, now watch this, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Significant parts of the last part of this. And come again to you. In passing, let me point out that for the first time in the Bible, the word worship is used here. You don't find it before here. That tells me to in offering those sacrifices, they knew unto patriarchy they were worshiping God. Worship is an act of obeisance to show devotion and submission. It's not just a thought of the mind. It's a thought of the mind that's acted out of the life, and the act is according to God's will. Thus, we worship God in spirit and in truth. So we are able to see that he is put to the test. But you see the great thought in his mind God will take care of this. Now, what was going on in his mind? If you had read all we referred to in getting up to this point, you would have seen in those great covenants that Isaac had to live in order for those promises to be made a reality. But we have to go to the New Testament to find out how Abraham had already reasoned it out in his mind. He knew that God's will did not contradict God's will. Faith does that, you know. And if you will, notice what we find when we go to the 11th chapter, which is the great chapter on Faith Hall of Fame and the people that populate it. And it is said in verse 17, by faith. Well, that means since faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 10 17, and these people, including Abraham, acted by faith, they were acting on the basis of God's word directing them and what they believed and did. So by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, there it is, faith was put to the test, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Well, that's significant he says that because the promises involved Isaac staying alive. But he offered him up anyway. How could he do this? Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Again, emphasis that those promises could not be fulfilled if Isaac didn't live. But God said, take him offering up a burnt offering. I'm testing your faith in me. And there's no indication Abraham had any thought that he would never disobey God in anything. Now watch. Here's what he did in his mind. Verse 19 accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. Now there's what Abraham worked out in his mind. You know God wrote the Bible and what's time to him? You read all of this over there in Genesis and the origin of things early on in man's history and you have to go over here to many thousand years later to find out what went on in his mind? It meant nothing to God. He just recorded it there in another part. And that demands of us that we study, study, study this divine volume to show ourselves approved of God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Now, when you look at this, you can see the agape love take control of him. Do you think Abraham had familial love for Isaac? Why, he was the apple of their eye. For many, many years, they longed for a son. And in that part of the world, to have a son was greater than we think of it. For it meant your line continues. The firstborn received the birthright. All sorts of things went along with the son. And yet Sarah, for all these years, the wife of a great chieftain, the way they would look at it, a very rich person, a powerful man, a wise man, a faithful man. She had no son. So much so that she tries to help out in the matter and says, you take my handmaid Hagar, Abraham, and have a son. But God comes back and says, the ladies' aid societies ought to stay out of some things. And that was the first effort where she <laughs> put her two cents in. She ought to keep it back. Because God had said, you and Sarah will have a son of yourselves. No, there won't be an inheritance in Hagar or anybody else. It'll be in the son both of you have 
How they must have longed for Isaac. Can you imagine in your mind, when you think of the babies we've had born, especially when people have the first babies, how there's rejoicing and happiness. But to them, oh, what rejoicing there must have been. And in the next chapter, the scripture plainly says, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee. And so he had to bring every emotional love he had into subjection to, if you love me, keep my commandments. Brethren, we fail so many times and we're in misery so many times because we work it the other way around. We let our emotions, our feelings, our attachments take over. And when we do that, <clears throat> so many times we're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and slide of man, whereby in cunning crackness they lay and wait to deceive. When if we would just resolve, God said it. He said what he meant. He meant what he said on my level of understanding. And I understand it. And I understand the obligation laid upon me to prove my love for him and my faith in him. And that's all I need to know. Speak Lord. Thy servant heareth. Command. And I will obey. That's foreign to our land today. Even in the church. Men are saying. Well if you have this good warm fuzzy feeling towards somebody. Then they must be alright. Or if you have this good sentimental feeling about whatever. Must be okay. Surely this person being this way or that way. So kind and nice and sweet. Surely God accepts them. You never learn that in your Bible. You never learn that to be the definition of the highest form of love. The other loves are in submission and subsidiary, secondary to the great agape love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, it profit me nothing. Now that's the kind of love he's talking about. That's why Paul spent so much time in it. Because if they wouldn't be in the mess they were in in the, book, in, in the Corinthian church, if they had exercised this love, it would have brought everything else in their lives, their feelings, emotions, whatever, in subjection to the will of God. And there wouldn't have been a need to correct them and all the mistakes they were making if they had exercised it. And so he wrote, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm becoming a sounding brass as a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. That doesn't mean a good warm feeling because everybody's nice to you. It means the love that brought Abraham in subjection to the point of offering his son to keep God's will because God knows what's right. God knows how to get us from earth to heaven. I don't. There is a way that seems right unto me, but the end there are the ways of death. I know it's not in man that walketh the direct his steps. Well, then who is God Almighty in his good word? And he who is love, the very essence of his eternal being, is love, has made it very clear of what he means when he did not spare his only son. So you see, here in Abraham, you have a figure. Of God himself giving his son to die for us. Notice he says, Paul does, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profit me nothing. There are people who are very religious who in obedience to error or things not taught in the Bible will sacrifice great things. It's not going to do them a bit of good. Oh, but that's hard and mean. No, it's not. Jesus said that there will be many on that day of judgment who will say, Lord, Lord. Did we not do many marvelous things in thy name? But what did Jesus say to them? Depart from me. I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. Why well, they called him Lord. In his name they did many wonderful things. Why would the Lord say that? Because they were doing them contrary to the authority of his will. And the proof of my love for God is compliance with his will. Doing what he said. And the way he said it. And for the reason he said it. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love then get not. Love bondeth not itself. It's not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Brethren, America seeks her own right and left. America does not have a lot when it comes to agape love. If there's anything that moves Americans, it's 
Well, what was the movie some years ago? Greed is good. That's not what the Lord says. Seeketh not her own is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity. Well, what does it rejoice in? In the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, these shall fail. Whether there be tongues, these shall cease, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Uh, for we know in part, we prophesy in part. That's the way the New Testament came, in part and parcel in the days of inspiration. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. We have the perfect law of liberty today. It's fully revealed and written down. We have the New Testament of the Christ. He says, then when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, here's the point where I'm headed because of our subject is on the love that practiced by Abraham and his faithful life. He then says, I'll just jump to verse 13. And now about a faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. How great is hope? Very great. Very important. How great is faith? So important. Thus Abraham selected as the father of the faithful. Why? Because he had the agape love that's greater than the other two. That always kept him doing what God said do in the way God said do it. And for the reason he said do it, no matter what he asked of me. For he will never ask of me anything that's not for my good. Abraham's faith is confidence of God and godly things being tested. Well, he passes the test, beloved. Now, Abraham knows how close he is to God. We're taught to draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. Now, how are you going to do that without knowing his will with a full determination to comply with it in all things? And thus, my faith has to be tested so I know how I stand. We accept that in everything else. Boot camp in the military, school, there are tests. All sorts of things put our... Life to the test in a given area. Some reason when it comes to God, we just think he's, well, he'll take anything we throw at him. What do you want? And if you're going to be a child of God, faithful as Abraham, you, listen to me, your faith more than once will be put to the test. And what your, what's going to be your disposition? Will it be like Abraham? Here's the thing to do. Unpleasant for me as a human, but right because God said so and he knows what I'm doing. I'll even get up early in the morning and take a three-day journey to get it done. Of course, as you go through the whole thing, you see, and I'll close on some of these matters. I'd like to develop them even further. You'll have to do that in your own personal Bible study. But I've often wondered what pulsed through the old man's mind when he who had been reared to worship God according to offerings Isaac looks around and says, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now notice, I told you all this the other day, I think last Sunday afternoon, in our studies of problems regarding marriage and so forth. And look at what Abraham said. And it ought to be the motto and the statement for every faithful child of God who walks in the footsteps of Abraham. Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering." Now, that meant a lot of trust had to be in Isaac toward his father Abraham. For listen to what's said next. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar. Imagine what's going through his mind. Built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar up on the wood. Now, what? What? Stergo, and phileo, emotional affection surged to the old man's heart. How did he keep himself under the mighty hand of God's authority? Because of his faith. This is God's will. He knows what he's doing. And notice the next statement. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Why is that in your Bible? What do you get from it? You read it. What does that mean to you? How does it mean you ought to approach God's will? What does it mean that God knows about you and how much you love? Uh, he loves you and you love him. What does that mean? 
These things, Paul said, were written aforetime for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And he's talking about the Old Testament Scriptures, Romans 15, 4. How does that help you make your choices? How are you going to go about making your choices? And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thy anything unto him. Now watch. This is accommodative language. In other words, God's accommodating us as he made us so we, we can understand what he's saying here. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now you get the idea that, well, God never did know he would do this to detest it. No, that's not the idea at all. God's omniscient. He knows all that's the object of knowledge. This is simply saying, Abraham, you now understand what kind of faith you have. And you would have never understood it if you hadn't been put to the test. Brethren, have you ever prayed for greater faith? Have you ever prayed for more fervent, righteous love? Have you ever prayed for greater dedication? More concerned to be walking the straight and narrow way and to teach others the truth and to contend for it and to be what God wants you to be? Have you ever even prayed, let me have a faith like Abraham? Well, then expect the test to come. And don't be surprised when they do. And if the devil can't get to you one way, I can tell you the way he'll get to you, though he may have several ways cut off. He can certainly test your confidence in God and his plan of salvation by getting to some member of your family. For there, the affections are great. There, the phileo and stergo types of love surge and are strong. And God is simply going to say, Will you love me supremely and keep on doing what you know is right, no matter what the case? Then look at verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Remember what he said to Isaac? God will provide. He didn't have in mind then what was going to be, but look what happens. He looked. And behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is above upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of the enemies, of his enemies. And then here's where it affects you and me. And in thy seed shall all the families of all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now listen, why? Why? Because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. He's a different man now, and so is Isaac. Oh, they were strong in great service to God, but they're stronger now. Brethren, you want to be stronger in your confidence and trust in God and the New Testament and the Bible and everything pertaining to Him? And then there's tests coming. It's going to put your love of Him to the test, your faith in He and His Word to the test. So we ought not be surprised when God allows Satan to come to us and check us out. Agape love. Though He were a son, yet learned the obedience. <coughs> by the things which he suffered and being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation listen unto all them that obey him Hebrews 5, 8 and 9 and we close by simply saying to any who's not a Christian do you believe with all your heart on the basis of the truth of God's word right and divided that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the son of God if you do then will you take the rest of it that says you must repent of your sins and the next it says you must confess your faith in Christ before men. And then to complete your obedience in becoming a Christian to be buried with the Lord in baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sin. As a child of God, 
Have you been tested and failed? Repent of it. Come back and say, I'll no longer turn to the left hand or the right doing God's will. Because someday I want, now listen to what Christ is going to say. Someday I want to hear. And you think of all we talked about, about faith and love. I want to hear the Lord say to me, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye in to the joy of thy Lord. If you love the Lord, keep his commandments, no matter what. If you're subject to the precious call of Jesus, we invite you to come on, we stand and sing.